All right. Second Samuel chapter 23. We're going to go ahead and read verses 9 through 12. It says, now, let's see here. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there, gathered together to battle, and when and the men of Israel were gone away. There's another translation in the way that it says, and next to him among the three mighty men was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, son of Ahohi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. And look, and the men of Israel withdrew. You see the difference there. The men of Israel withdrew. So what does that mean? Under fear, they turned away from the battle. All right. Verse uh, 10, King James Version. It says, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. And it says in the ESV, the men returned after him only to strip the slain. In other words, Look at that sword. Look at that shield. Oh, he got a couple of gold coins in his pocket. Let me see. But, but whenever it was time for the fight, they done left Eleazar, the son of Dodo, all by himself to fight this patch of Philistines. And, and, and hallelujah, the Lord gave him a great victory on that day. Verse 11. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils. Has anybody ever ate lentils in here yes. before? Hey, Amen. Miss Angela makes some mean lentils. Erin uh, and, and her sons used to call them dirt beans. <laughs> oh, we're eating dirt beans again. Okay, but that's what they are. They're kind of like a pea, or they're a mixture between a pea and a bean, I guess. And uh, anyway, that's it was a patch of peas. All right. And he says right here, they were, uh, the Philistines were gathered together and the troop it was a piece of ground full of lentils and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just give you glory and honor. Lord, we thank you for your precious word. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you would go before us this day. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help me to communicate the word that you've placed in my heart for your people. Lord, I pray that you would give me the grace that I need to present it from your heart, Lord. From your heart of love, compassion, the zeal that you have for your people, Lord. That you would send your only begotten and precious son to die for your people, O Lord God. I pray that you would allow your word to come out in that way, Lord. And that your people would understand how much you love them, Lord. And, yes. and the great lengths that you've gone through to save them, O Lord God. And, and that they would also understand that there's an enemy. And he's a deceiver, O Lord God. Prepare us, your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So last week we, we, and this was really part two of that. Um, last week we talked about Naboth and his vineyard, if you'll remember that. And who was Naboth? If you're not, if you haven't read the Bible a lot, let me just kind of bring you backwards. It was a time frame in Israel's history before the time of Jesus. During the time of the kings, there was a certain king at that time named Ahab. Ahab was a very wicked king, and he married a woman named Jezebel. Um, and Jezebel was a she was a she was a woman that practiced black magic. Okay, during that time frame, she worshipped false gods, and um, and she had many false prophets of Baal that she had brought into the kingdom. And so Ahab had allowed that to come into the kingdom, and there was a great influence of darkness in the midst of the kingdom during that time frame. And if you remember in the story, Ahab just wanted the guy's vineyard. He wanted Naboth's vineyard. And I told you last time that Naboth means fruits in Jezreel, which is where he was from, was, was named son of God. And so what I tried to say to you, and this is very true, that God has sown seed of the gospel into the earth and that that seed of truth is going forward. Amen. And, and it lights inside of the hearts and lives of men. And God, it's 
expects fruit to be produced from what it is that he's sowing. Like he's looking for people in the end. One day we will all stand before him. And when we stand before him, we will. We're going to give an account of what we did with our life during that time frame. Amen. And so the enemy Ahab goes to him and he wants to make a deal. And he wants uh, Naboth's vineyard. And when Naboth ends up responding to him, he said, the Lord forbid me that I give you the inheritance of my fathers. And you remember, we went through that whole story. And then Jezebel ends up coming up with a plan. Remember that? She's in the palace. She sees Ahab laying in his bed. He's all sad and crying. He won't eat any bread. And she says to him, are you the king of Israel or not? Get up. Dry your eyes, eat some bread. I'm going to go get that vineyard for you. And she sets up a deal. Remember, she tells him the whole thing right there in the room. She tells him the whole story. She says, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to set him up. We're going to try to act like we're going to make, give him honor. We're going to get two wicked men to go and be deceitful and to say that they saw Naboth doing some bad stuff. Then we're just going to take him out the ball game. And guess what? Now his vineyard is your vineyard. Wow. <laughs> and it's real simple. That easy. And, and, and I want you to know that this is that I want you to know, you know, there's an old saying and I learned this, heard it many times. Not every mountain is worth dying on. You ever heard that before? I'm not going to die on that mountain. Look, I used to be the confrontational captain, man. I like wanted to confront everybody about everything. Every little detail about it, especially your theology and your understanding about the Bible. I was ready to confront you at like left and right. You know, one of the things I've learned as, and maybe it's because I'm getting older or not old, I'm not like looking for a, 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 a scrap every time I turn around. Right, yeah. Some mountains really just aren't worth dying on. Mm -hmm. But some mountains are worth dying on. And a little bit about what I'm feeling in my spirit is to make sure I communicate to you properly that there's a mountain worth dying on. Amen. Yeah. And as we see changes that have been taking place upon the earth and everybody still I know you people shouldn't be asleep because I kind of talk to you all the time trying to arouse you and trying to make not trying to make you think the way I think but trying to at least allow your mind to think for a moment about what is really going on in the earth that we're living in right now I can tell you that the nation changed at 9-11 and COVID changed the world and that neither one of the stories that they told us was the truth. Absolute lies. Absolute lies. I'm not getting into all the conspiracy stuff behind it. But absolute lies. I'll just tell you this one thing. There was a news reporter that said, We found one of the passports on the ground in front of building such and such from one of the terrorists in the plane. Really? <laughs> really? Wow. And we're supposed to believe these things. But that's what we do. We believe whatever we're told, except we won't believe this. <laughs> we won't believe the word of God. We won't learn it so that we can believe it, so that we can order our lives around it. But we'll believe everything else that they tell us. Right. And the world's changing before our eyes. And you know, I, I had a conversation with, with, with a Muslim gentleman two days ago. And, and it was a great little opportunity. And he's like, oh, this stuff been going on. I'm like, oh, really? This stuff been going on. They've been putting children in cages. and they're cutting. Well, yeah, maybe so during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. <laughs> but come on now. We're a little bit more enlightened now. We're a little bit more intellectual. Everybody says the problem with humanity is that we need more intellect. We need more education. Seems like the more education we get, the worse off things are becoming. I'm trying to tell you, I'm not trying to say that what we're seeing in Israel right now is it. But it is on the way. <laughs> and when it comes, people better be ready. And just as Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard, but he chose instead to die for the inheritance that God gave unto him, these kinds of things continue to happen, you know. And, and not everything that we, that we face is worth dying for, but Eleazar... He, he, he was willing to die that day when he was fighting that band of Philistines. Shema was willing to die for that pea patch. Amen. The word of God says in Romans, it says that, no, we're more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us or who, who loved us. Amen. Revelation 12, 11 says this, that they overcame him. Who's him? The evil one, the dragon, the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. The first thing that you need to understand is that you will never overcome the devil in your life if you have not gone through the blood of the lamb. Amen. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the sacrifice that Jesus 
performed when he died naked on the cross for your sin and for my sin. You will never be able to make it through to the other side if you don't go through the blood of the Lamb. They overcame it by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life that I've been ashamed. I can remember one time in the old Bayou Peds building where we used to work. I was in an elevator and I was in the elevator. And I don't even remember what the person said. And the Holy Spirit prompted me to say something and I didn't. It's like my mouth was shut. And then they got out and the doors closed and I just felt this weight, you know? Isn't that just how the enemy is? He tries to get us to shut our mouth and then when the opportunity passes by, he's like, look at you, you fool. You couldn't even speak for your Jesus. Oh, you're so happy he died for you and you can't even say anything for him. You know what? You lying devil, get behind me, Satan. It is written, hallelujah, that I overcame you by the blood of the Lamb, the word of my testimony and I did not love my own life even unto death. Hallelujah. Are oh, we loving our own lives instead of being willing to die because Jesus said he that's going to follow after me must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow after me. You know, and, and that's a hard thing to do sometimes even just to die to reputation, to die to self, to die to how we want other people to perceive us, to die to unwillingness to be humbled in the, under the hand of God. Even after, and listen, if you people have been here more than once, you love God. I'm going to tell you, now I'm not trying to say because we got it figured out. I'm just trying to say, like, you're not like looking just to have your ears tickled, I believe. Amen. Right. Amen. And so, and I, and I thank you for that. I thank you for, for when you do come back. Amen. But even, even as much as we love the Lord, sometimes I just want you to know the enemy is fighting us tooth and nail. And he wants to. And listen, we're in a time frame. We're in a time of human history where playing, playing some kind of church game is not the thing to do right now. Amen. We really need to understand what the word of God is telling us. Amen. Amen. All right. So I want you to know about Ahab. Let's just talk just for a second about Ahab and Jezebel's approach. It's a very, very methodical approach because it's it's a characteristics that you'll see in the serpent. Okay, the serpent deceives. The dragon takes by force. The serpent deceives, right? But the dragon. See, if you go to Genesis, he's a dragon. He slithers into a garden in the dragon as a serpent. Uh, okay, when he brings deception, but in the end, he's the dragon at the end of the book of Revelation, and he's on a tear. And he's destroying anything that tries to stand in his way. And the word of God teaches that God allows him to do it for 3.5 years. Same amount of time that Jesus was in ministry on the earth. And then somebody may ask the question, why in the world would God allow such a thing? Well, it's not in my text this morning, but I'll just tell you real quick. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, because they, they refuse to believe the truth. Who's they? Plural pronoun representative of each and every human being that refused to believe the truth. Some people in churches, some people outside of churches. Because they refused to believe the truth. Well, what was the truth? Every word written in God's Bible. Oh, I think that if I love a woman and I'm a woman, then it's okay because I have a right to love. I think that if I'm a man and I love a man, that it's okay. I think that if I was born a little boy and I want to be a little girl, then it's okay because that's what I'm being told. And that's what the world says. But that's not what God's word says. God's word says something else. Oh, you keep preaching like that. You're going to be the first one to go, preacher. Maybe that's a mountain worth dying on. Amen. 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 That's right. So we're living in a time frame when there's a bunch of lies that are being pushed out to us. And I know I keep saying, I almost get tired of myself saying it, but maybe there's a reason that you got to keep saying it. So this is your device. And you're sitting there and, you know, like, dude, don't be hating on my social media, bruh. All right. And I'm over here like, and I'm just letting them speak to me. Ain't spent no time in the word of God. Oh, yeah, I'm saying it. I'm over here. Look at that. Just going through social media. What that person doing? What that person doing? Oh, yeah. And letting them preach to me. Letting the social media preach to me. Letting the music industry preach to me. Letting the shows on Netflix preach to me. But I don't even know the first thing about the Word of God. I'm talking about people sitting in churches, my friend. People sitting in churches for years. And I know what I'm talking about because I was one of the words. 
sitting in churches for years, and I was trying a little bit, but staying ignorant. So listen, you're a prime candidate for deception if you're not trying to get into the Word of God and to learn the Word of God, right? And that's what the enemy does. He comes in, and he comes by deception. And Nate, and Ahab's initial approach was not to take it by force. Ahab's initial approach was not dragon. It was instead serpent because he tried to make a deal. He tried to get permission. You remember that? He said, listen, I'll give you a better field. I'll give you a good price for it. Satan, uh, and, and, and so he tried to get permission and the initial approach was to entice Naboth to yield. See, the enemy wants to try to entice you to yield. I'm talking about in any situation and circumstance in your life, he's coming to you to try to entice you to yield towards compromise, to yield towards compromise that is opposite of God's word. I can sit here and list off a litany of things. Let's just get past all the all the addiction stuff because I mean, listen, we, we're not a, hopefully we're not a church full of that anymore. Hallelujah! The word of God says such were some of you, but hopefully we're not there anymore. But it could be anything. He he wants to entice you to compromise to get yourself into an argument type situation where you lose your temper with your husband or husband with wife or whatever. You're the believer and the enemy's over there baiting you. And maybe your spouse isn't even a believer and he's baiting you and he's baiting you and he's baiting you and then and you're trying and you're trying and then the next thing you go, know, you know, and then it's just like it explodes and it goes crazy and then the next thing you know you feel guilty because you realize you failed the Lord and you realize, oh, you know, that, that you let God down and, 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 and you've been praying for your spouse and that, that, listen, you know what you do? You shake the dust off, you go back in your prayer room, you get on your knees before the Lord, you repent that you missed it and you say, Lord, now teach me your ways Teach me, oh Lord God, what it means to put my faith in your finished work that you performed at the cross when you died for me. Lord, let me to believe that I am truly a new creation. Holy Spirit, help me that when this thing comes against me, this lying devil comes against me in this way, that you will give me Oh, supernatural discernment from the Holy Spirit that you paid for when you died on the cross. And then you'll begin to speak to me. And then I realize, ah, oh. Now, be careful now when you do that. Because you'll go through a stage also when you'll do this number here. You'll be like, honey, why are you acting? so silly right now. That's not good either. That's condescending. That's pridefulness. That's not genuine. No, 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 no. It needs to be legit. It needs to be honesty. The Lord's looking for honesty. It'd be like, and, and, and humility. See, that's why it's a beautiful thing what Sabrina was trying to say. That's why the illustration was a beautiful thing. Because if you get, now I'm not saying to just be getting on your knees because that could be a show too, right? I'm trying to make a point though. The Lord was trying to make a point through her that when you learn how to humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, some beautiful things can happen. Because see, the word of God says that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, in the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. See, the Lord is repelled against pride because it's the, it's the sin of Satan. So when he sits his pride, this is what I believe the Lord showed me. Well, what I was just been coming down here for was to say, it's not really that hard to get on your knees. It's really not. I mean, it is whenever the enemy is trying to convince you that you're going to look like a fool. Just like the first time I ever did it at Cornerstone Ministries, however many years ago, when I went up to the front, I was telling somebody that the other day when we went over there for a service. I was like, that's right there where I got down the first time. Because the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go to the altar like you've been doing at your house and whenever I did all of a sudden the enemy said there's people in this place that think you're weak and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit said there are people in this place that think you're weak but I'm making you stronger than they're ever going to know because they're not willing to come try it out they're not willing to come learn how to die to self to let me give them life amen he resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble sometimes we don't want to die is it okay if I just speak plainly? Let the Lord, Lord's word have its free course this morning. Like just let God speak to us and like it comes out of his word. Sometimes we don't really want to die in self. We're holding on to it. Amen. You know, we're holding on to a little bit of the old life. Amen. And we, and we don't want to let it all go. But anyway, the serpent comes in and he's trying to get Naboth to yield. And, and because I want you to know something. Satan, Satan cannot just take whatever he wants. 
He just can't have whatever he wants. Mankind, in Adam, God gave authority to Adam, and Adam had to relinquish the authority and give permission to the serpent to come into the garden and to have his way. And when he did, then he lost authority. Then the enemy had permission to come in. And so I'm just telling you, Satan can't just do whatever he thinks he can do. Okay, and you may not believe that, but I'm here to tell you that if you'll begin to learn to believe the word of God and begin to learn how to put your hope and trust in the word of God and begin to believe the truth of God's word instead of the lies of the devil, you too don't have to listen to what the devil's trying to tell you to do. Amen. Because the word of God says something different. The problem that people have is the unsaved, First of all, they're just blindly walking towards the edge of eternal destruction. Let's just call it what it is. Right, right. Oh, that's hard preaching. No, it's not. It's just the truth. Anything less than this would be hard. Uh, if the word of God says, if Jesus said this, you think I've come to bring peace, nay, but a sword to separate mother from fa brother, father from mother, to separate husband from wife, brother from sister, you know, father from daughter, son. Mother from daughter. You think I've come to bring peace on the earth? No, but a sword to bring division. Because, because those that in your very house that are unwilling to believe the truth of what I'm trying to tell you, there's going to be a separation. Now, that doesn't mean that God's asking you to divorce your husband because he's not a believer. Because the word of God says that the unbeliever wants to say, let him stay. I'm trying to make a point, though. It's going to bring division. Because your willingness to live for Jesus is more important than anything else that this lion serpent deceiver is going to try to bring towards you. And there's maybe a day whenever he, the dragon's like, okay, the deception ain't going to work. Well, I'm about to take it by force just like Jezebel did with Naboth. But hallelujah, I'm pretty sure when we get to glory, we're going to see old Naboth real happy dancing on streets of gold that he didn't relinquish. We're going to see... Uh, What's his name? Eleazar, the son of Dodo, real happy. And I'm pretty sure his hand won't be like cramped up anymore. I don't know if it was really cramped up or not, but I'm pretty sure he'll have them hands wide open, worshiping the Lord. And I'm pretty sure Shama will be real happy that he held on to that pea patch on the day that we see them dancing in the streets of glory. Listen, the unsaved are walking blindly towards the edge of eternal destruction. And if you and I don't get our heart and head right, if we don't let the Lord have his way in us, and we're the ones that are carrying the truth, there's going to be more people heading towards destruction. Oh, you make me feel uncomfortable, preacher. I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. And I'm trying to tell you that if you have the word of God in you, and that there's people that you know that aren't saved, the Lord wants to give you the opportunity to share truth with them. Now we got to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Not everybody's created the same way. Now we don't all have the same personality. But God wants to open up the doors for us to be able to share the truth with those that are lost. So that's the first thing. An unsaved are just walking blindly, right? Because what I'm trying to say is that Satan can't take whatever he wants. But people have problems spiritually that allows the enemy to have his way in their lives. Number two, they say, I love God, but they don't really have a desire to look, to know him. You understand what I'm saying? That was me for a long time in my Christian walk. I loved God, but, and I tried some, I would read a proverb every day. I'm reading a proverb every day ain't going to get it. Now, don't get me wrong. Read a proverb every day. That's fine. But that by itself is not going to get it, my friend. That's right. Hold on a second now. Here he goes again. <laughs> we inundate ourselves with worldly information 24-7. It sounds like I'm preaching some kind of legalism, huh? Some kind of, what, does it sound weird to you? I hope it doesn't. Maybe it sounds weird to somebody on video, but I hope it doesn't sound weird to you. It's like, golly, man, he keeps talking about, yes, because we inundate ourselves with the informatics of the world, but we refuse to inundate ourselves with the word of God. We need to allow the word of God to have its way in our heart and in our lives. So second problem is they say, I love God, but they have no desire to know him. And then the third thing is they know his word. They just disobey it because, because they think it's not really that big of a deal. Can I be honest with you? I've been all three of those. <laughs> That's why I can speak about it with you know straight faith. I've been all three of those. You know, and, and, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about the snake and his plan. Many times we underestimate man's free will and we also underestimate the trickery of Satan. Satan slithers with his traps and tricks into position. Now just bear with me right here. His venom paralyzes. 
He wraps, he squeezes, he constricts, he wraps, he entraps. And once the trap is set, it's not very easy to get out. Now, it's not impossible. Psalm 91 says that he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. What I'm trying to say is, is that it's much easier to get out of the trap before he sets the trap. That's the point that I'm trying to make to you, right? One last thing to say about the free will deception and the strike is that I know I was thinking, I was sitting laying right here yesterday morning, I think, or the morning before, and I was typing on this message. And all of a sudden, I was thinking about snakes, and I saw this, like the tongue, you know. You know what I'm talking about. I'm not doing a good job. But you get a flicker of the tongue. The flicker of a snake's tongue. And I was like, what in the world do snakes constantly flicker in their tongues? I mean, I know it looks wicked, but like, what's, there's a purpose problem. So I did. I Googled it. And I found this cool little video. Okay. And this is what they claimed in the video. It's very educational. That the serpent uses its tongue to sense its environment. Yeah. It's putting little signals out there, like a bat, kind of like what it's sonar. And it can actually measure changes in temperature. And it can tell where its prey is yes. further around. And what it'll do is it slowly slither over here. And, okay, and it kind of... And it kind of like... And yeah. so it's sensing its environment. And it's preparing the best position it can find before it actually makes the strike. Before it sinks its fangs. Before it... Rolls around and starts to constrict, right? And he's setting them up. He's setting up his prey is what he's doing. He's testing out that environment. One of the things I started thinking about that is that the enemy will set up things in our environment. Yeah. Yeah. He will bring a dis. He will bring some. See, just as God has a blessing for you, if if you're like if you're a single woman, if you're single man, the word of God says, a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. But you think that just because, just as the Lord can find you something good, that the devil can't bring you something bad? Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Trust me. Woman of God. <laughs> you better be careful. Trust me, man of God. Come on. Oh, Lord, don't even get me started on that rabbit trail because we'll never get back out. But listen to me. He'll, he'll do all kinds of crazy stuff. He'll, he'll offer you a better job. You'll never even realize that before you know it, you won't ever be able to go to church because of your better job. Right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, but you know, I can sit back and I can watch church on YouTube. Everybody does that now. But that's not really the will of God that you constantly... I understand that sometimes you might watch church on YouTube. I'll watch messages on YouTube all the time. I'll find me some good preachers. Hallelujah. And I'll just sit there and I eat it up. I go to sleep listening yeah. to preachers almost every night. But the, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is that God wants his people in the house of God together. He wants us yeah. to learn how to fellowship with one another. Yeah. He wants us to learn how to walk in unity. You know why? Because sometimes in families, we don't always do things right. And, and in a true family, there has to be the willingness to learn from one another, the willingness to be able to make mistakes, the willingness to be able to say, I'm sorry if I made a mistake, and the willingness of the other party to give forgiveness. And if we're not willing to do that, then we're not living our lives like Jesus. Amen. No, th th this is a practice run right here, my friend. God created all of this to see how we're going to handle this temporary world to, to see what's going to happen whenever we face eternity. Mm -hmm. All right. So it flicks its tongue many times before it sinks its fangs. It's sensing both the prey and the environment. It's sensing and adjusting as needed. Like a snake, Satan hides his real intent. Until he's ready. He to strike. He hides in the shadows. He watches our responses to situations. You think the devil ain't watching? See, if you don't believe in the devil, if you don't believe in demonic spirits, you're in the wrong church. Yep. Right. They got another church somewhere around here. I mean, I don't know where it is, but they're going to talk to you about, you know, they're going to talk to you about how, you know, I don't know, something, something that's going to sound good and it's going to feel good. And it's going to make you feel better, okay? It, it, you know, and I think this makes you feel better too when you start to catch on to what the enemy is doing. <laughs> Praise God when you start to get the discernment, right? He hides in the shadows. He watches our, so he's going to put people, situations up out to position for the strike. Now, one of the interesting things was this: that in the video also they showed a rat. I'm not trying to say you're a rat, okay? But I'm trying to say that the rat was the snake's prey. Right now, one of the things they said about the rat, I thought this was interesting, is that a rat has a sense of smell. I think it might even be better than a dog. I might be wrong, but I mean that's 
That's really the little thing that God gave rats is that they can smell stuff. All right. There's more rats than there are human beings on the earth. Now, the video I watched, they look so cute. They look like some little gerbils and hamsters running around. They just, they look so cute. Okay. And so rats can smell. So theoretically, a rat ought to be able to smell a snake. But then they showed this video where this rat had a big old juicy grape. And I think the grape was good because my whole story started off in a vineyard. Right? And so that little rat was so happy. He was holding that little half of a grape in his paw. And he was like... <laughs> and I was thinking, man, how close that open grape is to his nostrils. <laughs> he ain't smelling nothing right now but the sweetness of that grape. And there's that slithery snake. <laughs> <laughs> Since in his environment, he's like got, you know, snakes, if you ever look, sometimes they look like got a smile on their face. He's getting real happy, happy. Because <laughs> he's about to sink his fangs into this thing. What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that sometimes, see, the enemy's bringing distractions. Yeah. He's bringing distractions our way, and he's putting these things in our path. And if we're not careful, we're going to get distracted. And we're going to be so focused on the distraction that we're not going to be prepared when the strike comes. And then the next thing you know, he doesn't set his trap, my friend. And once he sets his trap, it's not that you can't get out, but you don't open up a door and it is not an easy thing to get out of the trap. Amen. That's right. Praise God. But hallelujah, the Lord's already died to set us free. Oh, yes. And it's to know that and to believe that and to hold on to that. Amen? Praise God. So look, I actually got you two specific examples right here. I got two single adults. Both desire companionship. Both love God. It starts innocent. Starts off as a friendship. Starts slow. Talking turns to texting. And then before you know it, texting turns to kissing. And then from there, well, there's not a whole lot left of the story. But then I can hear someone in the crowd. How dare you, preacher? I'm an adult. And I'm single, and I can kiss anybody I want to, and I can make out with anybody I want to. I'm just a real dude, bro. You can make out with anybody you want to. You can kiss anybody you want to because you're an adult. But has anybody ever told you what happens when you start that process? <clears throat> yeah, kissing's good. Can, can I just go ahead and talk PG-13 for a second? I hope so. This might even be a little bit higher than that. Lord help us. Kiss is real good whenever it's for foreplay and sexuality. Right? It's real good for that. And foreplay and sexuality is real good when it's in the marriage bed. It's a real good thing when it's in the marriage bed. But when it's not in the marriage bed, it's not a good thing at all. Because it begins the process of opening up doors that allows things in. That it makes it very difficult to close the door. Listen to me. Some people don't realize that, but you think that it's turning into love. But in reality, it might not be love after all. It might be spirits of lust. All I'm trying to say is this. Really take it slow, man. Take it slow. Slow it down. And try to learn whether or not the people even love the Lord. Try to learn whether or not people love the Word of God. Try to learn whether or not, you know, th that this is even supposed to be of God. But instead, we come rushing in and we do it the old way. Like back whenever I was in the eighth grade. And one of these girls going to kiss me. And then the next thing you know, it turned into a big old mess. Yeah, amen. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. It's not worth it. It creates a mess. Amen. All right. Trust me on that. So you can do what you want with your free will. And that's kind of like what I was trying to talk to you about. You can open up a device. You can look at an image on your device. Because you were being tempted to do that. Your friend told you to do. To, hey, man, check this out. Da, 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 da. This stuff's out there, bro. Like, and then you click on it and then boom, the next thing you know, you're knee deep and you're having a hard time getting out. Listen to me. I'm trying to tell you that once that trap is set, it, that image is stuck in your mind and it's difficult to get out of that thing. I'm here to tell you that the Lord has died to set you free and to deliver you though. Amen. So he flicked his tongue. You sensed you were ready for a nibble. The paths converge. All right, so that was point number one, two lonely single people. Point number two, they're really past all that. These people are past that. They done tried, old girl done, had, done tried about five dudes that said that they were Christians, right? Old, old boy done tried five girls that said she was a Christian. 
they done, they so tired of drinking in bar rooms. They just done with all that. And they kind of like looking for, but they're still lonely. And they're looking for something. And so what they do is they go, they want some good social companionship. So they want to meet some different people. So they go try to go and start going to churches. But then without even knowing it, they settle into a church. I'm not trying to say every church is full of false doctrine. That's not what I'm trying to say anymore. I used to think that maybe that there was only two churches that were preaching the truth. I, I realize better than that now. Okay, but I'm just trying to say this. But there are churches full of false doctrine. And can I tell you this? False doctrine is connected to demonic spirits. No, no, I don't think I said that loud enough or plainly enough. False doctrine is connected to demon spirits. Because see, the Holy Spirit doesn't lie. Demonic spirits lie. And they clothe truth in something else to get it in. It's a deceptive tactic of the serpent. And if you think spirits of lust are bad, <laughs> connect yourself to spirits of false doctrine, Amen. thinking that you're just wanting to meet some nice people and you're just looking for a social gathering. All that seems right. All that seems pure. But listen, if you're not careful, you will connect yourself to things that will try to draw you in and cause confusion. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. So Jezebel and Ahab were types of spiritual darkness infiltrating the kingdom of God. Adam allowed the serpent into the garden. Ahab allowed Jezebel into the kingdom. And Christians have been known to allow darkness into their lives. The Apostle Paul warned this, though, in Ephesians 4.27. He said in the King James, don't give place to the devil. He said in the NASB, don't give the devil an opportunity. He said in the NIV, do not give the devil a foothold. Eliezer, the son of Dodo and Shammah, were examples of God's people taking a stand against darkness and not giving into it. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of of the devil. That word wiles, according to the American dictionary, devious or cunning stratagems. Strategies. The devil has strategies. Ephesians chapter 6 says this, wherefore take unto yourself the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, I want to just kind of take you, just, just bear with me for a second. It says, that you would withstand, that you would be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, it says in the evil day, all right? What, what most translators would try to tell us is this, is that it's talking about in the day that evil shows up on your doorstep, whenever that is. It might be tomorrow. The evil's probably already shown up on your doorstep more than once, has he not? Has evil not shown up on your doorstep? Has he not slithered into your life? Has he not offered some type of deception? Has he not baited the trap? And have you not sprung the trap? And have you not been stuck before? Yes, you have. He ain't quitting. And he, listen, he's going to try the same thing again. Until he knows that he's exhausted that, he's just going to, and especially if you keep falling into it, he's going to be like, this is so easy, dude. It's not even any work. I'm just going to keep doing the same thing because it keeps falling for the same thing. Now, once you start to catch on to that, then he'll finally change the bait and he'll figure something else out. He'll come in another way, right? But, 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 but I want you to see, it says withstand in the evil day. So he's already had a bunch of evil days and there's going to be more evil days. But let me ask you a question. If we keep falling, on the evil day, like in other words, when those days keep coming, what, what, what are we going to do if it gets really bad? Right. Amen. Like, you know, what are we going to do? And, and listen, according, I, I'm not, I want to get into an argument about end times, timing. That's not really what, what my message is about. But I mean, when we see, let me just say this. Okay, let's just pretend for a second that half the church is pre-trib and half the church is mid-trib. Okay, let's just look at it like that. Let's just put all that out. Do you understand that in order for the man of sin to be given an opportunity to bring peace on the earth, it makes sense that there has to be chaos? <laughs> who wants a man of, who wants to give up their sovereignty right. just for the heck of it? Do you want to become, I mean, I love the Mexican people. I'm about to go to Mexico here in a little bit. Okay, I paid for my own ticket, by the way, just so you know. 
Uh, you know, yeah. So I'm about to go to Mexico and minister the gospel by the, by the grace of God. Hallelujah. I love Mexican people. I love me some brother guy. Amen. But I don't want America to be Mexico. That's right. I, right. I'm sorry. I don't. If you don't like that, I mean, I, I didn't mean to offend you. I like being an American. <laughs> I, I, I like the liberties that this country has provided me. It doesn't mean that I don't want to help Mexican people. It doesn't even mean that I don't want Mexican people in America because I do. Because me- half the time Mexicans work much harder than Americans. Come on, yes. Come on. Hallelujah. I just don't want to open up the border and let everybody flood through and half of them aren't even Mexican. They're Hamas. Right. Right. I still want to pray for Hamas. I want Hamas to get saved. You might be like one of my, somebody I knew before said, oh man, I'm so glad Osama bin Laden's burning in hell. I don't want nobody burning in hell. I want people to repent and to get saved and I want their soul to be with the Lord. Hallelujah. That's what I want. Amen. But, but if we can't stand when evil comes in the day, how will we stand in the evil day is what I want to know. You, you get the point what I'm trying to say? The Lord is wanting to prepare us. Amen. He says, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Are you saved this morning? Yes. If you're saved this morning, the scripture is saying you used to be in darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. So you need to walk as children of the light. Amen. Try, and, and try to learn what's pleasing to the Lord and not to participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. Let me read that part right there one more time. This is Ephesians. I'm reading out of the NASB, so you don't have to put it up there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prepare you. October the 25th, Wednesday night, Yvette's going to do a teaching on Halloween. She's going to expose the truth about Halloween. Amen. If you love Halloween, I'm just being real with you. I love you. So don't take it the wrong way. But if you love Halloween and you plan on clinging to it, I'm gonna, hold on, I'm not being extra. I know. If you plan on clinging to Halloween, don't, don't come on October 25th and don't click on the YouTube video. And then that way you won't have to be offended. But if you want to know the truth about Halloween, Amen. Either come Wednesday night when you've had, because you've been studying this stuff for a long time. Amen. Or click on the YouTube when it comes across your radar. Amen. And then you can see. And let me just say this. I realize everybody brings their kid trick-or-treating and they trying to worship the devil. I ain't no dumb dumb. But the point is, let me not even get into that. You know what? I'll say something. Oh, Lord, I'm about to get myself a trouble. You got young people up in here. There's other times of the years where, I, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be careful. You ever heard of an anagram? Yeah. An anagram is whenever you take letters and you create new words. It's a form of occultic magic where they take a word and they put it here and you don't even realize it, but you're actually engaging in them. There's an anagram and you can go back and you can try to figure it out for yourself later. Satan's claws. Satan's claws. You can go home and you can do an anagram with that. You can switch them letters around and you'll probably get a little epiphany later on. Amen. Uh, something that's stealing the glory from God. People say, yeah, but he wasn't even born on blah, blah, blah. Okay, but on the day he was born, let me just tell you this. Heaven opened up and angelic choir began to sing and said glory to God on yes. earth. Peace. Hallelujah to the earth. Peace unto all men because unto you this day a Savior is born. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I don't even know what happens when a bunny starts laying eggs. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, I know. I mean, but, but listen, hold on. I got a right to say it because it's offensive to me because it's been stealing the glory of my Jesus who hung naked on a cross 2,000 years ago for my sin. And now they're trying to do it. And rose from the dead. Yeah. And now they're trying to change the narrative. And look, let me just say this. I done participated in all that stuff. Yeah. It's not like I woke up one morning like this. 
Praise God. But anyway, what am I trying to say? Expose them. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. But it's easier if you just participate. It's easier if you just go ahead and continue to do it. It, it, it just causes less conflict. It causes less friction. It makes people happy. They like you better. You become more popular. I'm sorry. That's not me. Be separate. Thank you. Be ye separate, says the Lord. Yes. What fellowship does light have with darkness? Right. Come out from among you, them, says the Lord. Yes. What fellowship does light have with darkness? Yes. Amen. And for each person, they have their opportunity to make their own choices. All right. Sometimes, though, we feel weak to stay. Yeah. Yes. My dad, look, every year my dad would still write it on there. He'd say, from, and then he'd write the name. And he'd give, give my girl some money. I'm like, Dad, I've been telling you since they were like in, while they were in Danielle's belly, that we don't believe in this. He's like, boy, I do what I want to do, you hear? <laughs> I, like, I should have just said, you know what, take your money. But I, went, I, I was a little too weak to stand at the time. Especially like he put like two or three bennies in there. And it's like, you know, like we buy the girls some clothes, man, you know, whatever. And then he do it to me too. He said, from? And he write his name, he had like about three or four hundred dollars in there. I mean, you know, if I was really gonna take a stand, I said, keep your keep your money, Judas. <laughs> yeah, no. But I didn't say it. But that was just trying to like you're trying to cajole me, but maybe I wasn't strong enough to stand. Sometimes we feel too weak to stand. You know, I want to tell you this. Shama and uh, Shama and Elias are the son of Dodo. That's just a funny name to me. But they Whenever David's men, they were known as the, some of David's mighty men. Yeah, I don't know if you realize that or not, but the Bible talks about David's yeah. mighty yeah. men. There were two of them. Yeah. Okay, and when they first came to serve him, see, he had not received his crown yet. He had been anointed, but not appointed. He had been yeah. anointed by Samuel to be the king, but he wasn't sitting on his throne yet, and, and David was on the run from Saul. Amen. Can I tell you that Jesus has already been anointed king? Amen. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. On this earth, though, right now, in this time frame where we are, Jesus is not ruling and reigning the way that he will. One day he is going to, according to the word of God, sit on the throne of David, and he is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem during the millennial reign of Christ. And there's going to be a flip-flop, my friend. And the flip-flop is going to be that the spirit of Antichrist is not going to be prevalent on the earth. Instead, it's going to be the spirit of the Christ because the dragon is going to be enclosed in a bottomless tent for a thousand years. And it's going to be a big flip-flop. And that's going to be a beautiful thing. Amen. But, but what I, so, so what I'm saying is David is a type of Jesus. David's men are a type of believers. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 22. We'll read verses 1 and 2. If Haley puts that up there, uh, we're going to just go ahead and take a look at this real quick. It says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him and everyone that was in distress... And everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. I think about that. I don't know about you, but I'm, I mean, if I'm getting ready to try to take my throne, if it's time for me to sit down as king and I know I've been called to be king, I'm probably not looking for these guys to be my warriors. Distress, debt. Discontented, you know, the, the, the American Dictionary defines discontented as dissatisfied, especially with one's circumstances. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, having a church full of people like that. You know, I'm so discontented, but I guess I'm going to keep going to this church because there's nowhere else for me to go. Like, if you're the pastor, you probably don't want a congregation full of people like that, right? That's what I'm thinking. You know, and so here he is. He's the king, and he's really looking to move forward with the kingdom of God. Amen. But but here's these people that come to them. Think about that. They were distressed. They were in a bind. But after spending time with them... After spending time with him, these men were later described as Eliezer's hand grew weary in the battle, but his hand clung to the sword. I don't know if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been in like a fight or you've been working so hard in the day. Like I ran, okay, this is the best thing I know how to describe. I was on the back of a boat one time offloading stuff for a long, long time. Like many, many hours we were down there and sweating, sweating, it was hot. 
And all of a sudden, my body started to like, like cramp up. Like I couldn't open my hand. And, you know, and they had some salt pills. Somebody said, oh, you got some salt pills on the back of that. I didn't have a tin of salt pill, but I'm like, okay, if it'll help. And, I took, and then, you know, it didn't take very long. Next thing you know, I can move my hands again. Okay, well, let's keep going. I, I, I finished two marathons, and I didn't know. I forgot about the whole salt pill trick. I didn't realize why, but they have, at the very end, they were having some salt packs. And I got to about mile 22, 23, and, and look, all of a sudden, the calf muscles cramped. Like, I'm talking about technique. I mean, you know, Alyssa knows what that is, but it's just, when, whenever you lose all your sodium and you don't have exchange of your ions and the muscle just yeah. cramps up and you can't don't function. And then you're like, I mean, it's like, oh, I'm going to finish. Well, how are you going to finish like that? You got four more miles to go, boy. And then look, I'm like, man, why y'all got that salt right there? Because you're going to need it. Oh, hallelujah. Drop that salt in there. And the next thing you know, things start loosening up. Oh, I'm going to finish this thing. I ain't going to win, but I'm going to finish it. <laughs> I don't know if that's what happened to that man's hand or not. There's a part to me that wants to think that, but I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know how well you can fight with your hand clamped up like that because usually it means it's the muscles down here. I, don't, I know I'm getting technical on you. I'm trying to make a point. I believe as he was getting weary, though, the Lord gave him strength. Yeah. I believe the Lord gave him, no, boy, you're not going to let go of that yeah, sword. Yeah, yeah. You're going to keep on fighting because this ain't the time to quit because if you quit right now, you're going to die. And I want to tell you something, that there's a time that's coming upon the earth whenever you're going to wish, I'm going to wish, they're going to wish, you're going to wish, sir, ma'am, that we wouldn't have spent quite as much time on social media and we would have spent more time in the Word of God learning about the Word of God so that we would learn how to war. But look, the kind of war that we're going to be involved in is not this kind of war with that kind of sword, but it's this kind of sword right here. Yeah, yeah. And the process to victory is what Jace did at the end of the illustration when he fell to his knees and lifted his hands in the air, surrendered to God because the Apostle Paul learned something in the Corinthian letter. He said, in weakness, his strength is made perfect. Jesus oh, told him yes. that. In your weakness, oh, my yes. strength is made perfect. Yes. See, that's what we got to do. We got to come to the end of self. We got to learn how to lower self so that Christ oh, can begin to give us strength. Amen. Amen. God's word tells us not to grow weary in well-doing. When everyone else ran away in fear, God helped Eliezer grip the sword tighter. You know, I couldn't help but ask myself, why why you want to fight over a patch of peas, Shama? <laughs> because the peas don't belong to the Philistines. This pea patch belongs to God. He gave it to us, and the people of God don't give up their inheritance to the devil. Amen. If the New Testament Christian would start spending more time learning about the Scripture so that they could believe what God says about them instead of what the world says, mm -hmm. they too would become kingdom warriors. You know, earlier I had something I wanted to say in that scripture where I said, you formerly were darkness and I went off on the Halloween and all that other stuff. I remember when I was young and, and I'm just trying to, you know, we don't have as many teenagers in here this morning as I thought we might have, but I'm just going to say it anyway. I put like in some little small letters right here, a teenage girl whispers to her friend about what her and her boyfriend did two nights ago. Now, the reason I'm saying that to you is I can remember being 13 years old, and I was pretty innocent at the time. And whenever, and I remember this dude coming to me, and he's like, pss, 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 and he's telling me about him and his girlfriend. Dude, that was more powerful than a pornographic magazine. I'm telling you right now, when I started listening to what that dude was telling me, because I didn't know nothing about him, I was like so caught up in that. I was like, wow. And the next thing you know, it's like, I'm wanting to try to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you as a child of God, according to the word of God, that ain't where you want to be. Amen. You don't want to get caught up in that trap. But just because Pastor Matt said it, don't mean people are going to listen. I'm just trying to help. And that's why I'm trying to tell you, you need to get into the word of God for yourself, young man, young man. Y'all need to get into the word of God for yourself. And you need to learn the word of God. And you need to learn how to trust in what the word of God says, amen, for yourself. Because the devil wants to, he wants to grab a hold of you. And he wants to sink his fangs into you. And he wants to put that poison in you. And I'm trying to tell you right now, you can be a pastor's daughter. You can be a pastor's son. You, it don't matter how much your mommy and your daddy love Jesus. God ain't got no grandchildren. Come on, Lord. You don't have to learn and you make a choice whether you're going to serve the Lord for yourself That's or not. Right. And if you choose to serve the Lord, then praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a good thing.
Yes. But understand that there's going to be deception. There's going to be fights. Amen. The enemy is going to come against. You know, this thing we're seeing with Israel is a big thing. I believe that. America, the things that are happening in America right now as we speak, it's a big thing. The vineyard was a big thing for Naboth. The pea patch was a big thing, right? But you do understand there's something bigger, right? And, and the conflict is connected to the kingdom of God. The conflict is connected to your soul. In Luke chapter 17, verse 21, this is what the Lord said. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus said that if you're saved this morning, what does it mean to be saved, preacher? I need some help. Okay, it means that you have given your heart to God and you have acknowledged in your heart, not just your head, but you've acknowledged in your heart, I want you, Jesus. Come into my heart, come into my life, forgive me of my sin, forgive me, I want to live for you. And if you've said that from your heart and you meant it, Amen. Then, then you will know that you meant it because then the Holy Spirit is going to start changing you. The things that you used to like, you're going to start feeling kind of weird about, it, right? That means the Holy Spirit moved in. And when the Holy Spirit moves in, if you listen to that more than the other stuff, it's going to grow stronger. But once the Holy Spirit moves in, if you ignore what you hear and continue to go to that stuff, it's going to get weaker. And you're not going to find the freedom that God has provided for you. So Satan wants the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is in God's people. And people think that they're ready. And I hope that we're ready. I hope that God's people are ready. I've been spending a lot of time in prayer for other pastors. I've been spending a lot of time in prayer for the believers and for the saints. And I mean it. When I'm praying, it's a genuine heartbroken prayer. For God's people. Because I believe that God's people are right and ready for deception. Yeah, amen. Because I don't believe that God's people really understand the word of God like they should. And I believe that so many of God's people are clinging to the ways of the world. And they're not wanting to let go. And it's allowing demonic spirits to cause confusion and deception. Amen. And it's clouding their spiritual eyes. And they can't see and hear properly from the Amen. Lord. See, that's why I say the things I say. And that's why I try to take time. I know I'm a long preacher, but I try to explain what I'm trying to say. Because see, I used to, when I got saved at Twin City Gospel in Berwick, Louisiana, I'm telling you right now, I personally believe that woman was a mighty woman. God. I can't tell you how many preachers came out of that ministry. Yes. I'm talking about men of God that have been in ministry for years yes. came out of this woman's ministry. Yeah. Okay. And she used to. Now, I don't, I don't know that I agree with everything she said, but there's a part to some of the things she said that was probably real. Like, in other words, she, she would say, if you didn't make it to church on Wednesday night, you're going to miss, brother. And she was talking about, you're going to miss the rapture. Okay, now that's a little extreme, all right? Yes. But there could be some truth to that. Because if you start to, not because you were sick and you stayed home all night, that's not what I'm trying to say. But if you get into the habit of you're just staying out of church because now you've become complacent in your walk and you didn't realize it, but you started to allow sin in and other things are enticing you. You understand what I'm getting at? That's what she was talking about. She was talking about you let your guard down and the next thing you know. So that's I don't want to just leave you with something that sounds crazy like that. That's why I try to explain what I'm trying to communicate so that you understand what it is that I'm really trying to say. I don't want people to have little snippets and to say, oh, this man's preaching some kind of crazy stuff. No, I'm trying to tell you the devil, he wants to bring in lies. And that's what he did to Adam and Eve. And he wants to try to steal the inheritance. Amen. The, devil, the devil told Jesus in Luke chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, the devil told Jesus, the devil said unto him, all of this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. If you therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan told Jesus that the kingdoms and their glory were delivered unto him. 
That, that, how, what, how do you think that happened? Because Adam gave them to it. Because Adam was given the original authority and dominion over the earth. But Adam relinquished his authority to the enemy. And the word deliver means to surrender or yield. But God gave it to Adam. But Adam traded his authority to Satan for a lie. And let me just say this. Jesus doesn't yield to Satan or his Friends, And what I mean by that is he ain't going to yield to Satan's friends, but he's also going to yield to his own friend. Matter of fact, Jesus ain't even going to yield to one of his own besties. Because, see, in Matthew chapter 16 and 23, but he turned and said unto Peter, get thou behind me, Satan. You are an offense unto me, for you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of me. He told Peter the same thing he told Satan. And you know, one of the things that I noticed about that story is this, is that in both cases, they're trying to convince Jesus to sell out for something temporary. Mm. The devil's over there trying to convince Jesus to sell out for the temporary kingdoms of the earth. And Peter, and you got to know the background on the story, the, ch the children of Israel during the time frame of Jesus were expecting Messiah to come back as a king. Y'all, Most of y'all know that, but some people might not know that. Now, if you know the history of it, under the Roman occupation, Rome was on top of Israel and taking all their money in taxes, and the people were miserable. And they looked back at the prophecies, and they were hoping that the king died. That was spoken of in Isaiah would show up and deliver them. And so whenever Peter hold to her Jesus said, I'm about to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Peter's like, not so, Lord, does not be for you. You're about to usher in the kingdom. And he's probably thinking, and I'm going to sit on your right hand. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you savor not the things of God, but instead you savor the things of men. And many times that's what we're doing. We're still savoring the things that men savor. We're still hungry for the things that men and women are hungry for. We're still hungry for the things of the world instead of the things of God. There's no time to get snared in Satan's traps. Amen. The Lord teaches us in Ephesians that he's given us an inheritance. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 it says that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Yeah, I, I love that verse because look, I never knew. Did you know that you have um, that your understanding has eyes? <laughs> I know I preached that. Some of you are like going to sleep. And I preached that for ten years. Your eyes have under your understanding has eyes. It's talking about your inner man. Your spiritual man has a set of spiritual eyes. And the apostle Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus is that they would be open, that they would be enlightened, and that they would be able to see. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because see, if we're all caught up in the temporary things of the world, if we're still savoring the things of the world, we're not able to see the things that God has planned for us, the great inheritance that he has planned. And we will turn in. We'll sell our vineyard. We'll just walk away from the pea patch. We'll just like, you know what? My hand's tired. And I'm going to just drop the sword. Okay, come on, somebody. Help me out. I'm preaching better than your amen. I can promise you that because one day you might need some of this. Amen. I hope you don't. Oh, you're going to need it one way or the other, but I hope you really, really, really don't. But we need the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened. Amen. You know, the people that failed God in the, uh, the people that failed God in the Bible, Adam was deceived and delivered his power to Satan. Look at this. You may not even remember Esau. He didn't care. So Adam was deceived. Esau didn't care. He sold his birthright for a bowl of lentils. The ten spies didn't believe, and they said they were grasshoppers in the eyes of the giants. Israel cowered in fear and unbelief as Goliath ridiculed God's people. The prodigal son spent his inheritance on prostitutes and pig slop. Adam failed, but Jesus said it is written, Satan. Esau sold out, but Jacob wrestled with God until finally his name was changed to Israel. The ten grasshoppers died on the other side of Jordan, but Joshua and Caleb crossed over and killed giants. Israel cowered, but then David showed up and sunk a rock in Goliath's head and fed his flesh to the birds. The prodigal woke up one day, lost his taste for pig slop and prostitutes, and said, I'm going home to serve my father. And there unexpectedly received again his authority Hallelujah. with a ring and a robe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Satan tries to convince us that he has something better. He's going to have a better wife for you. A better one. An upgrade. He's going to have a better husband for you. A better job. A better car. 
lies and distractions. He uses to get an entry and keep us away from our purpose for God's kingdom. Like a little rat with a grape. Smelling that grape and not ready for what's going on around him. And the enemy's about to come in and say, but, you know, I just want to leave you with, I'm almost done. Y'all ready? Y'all good? Like, it's only 11.35, so <laughs> that bad. And I promise you, I'm going to keep moving so we can get you out here, okay? But look, I want to say this. Lies and distractions he uses to get an entry to keep us away from our purpose for God's kingdom. It's a difficult thing to try to convince people that there is a future kingdom to embrace when you live in a physical realm. Right. I've been preaching this for a long time, but I don't even know, even though I was preaching and how much I was, I was bought in. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that whenever you live in a world that you touch things and you see things and you smell things and you hear things and you taste things, to believe that there's something bigger and that the way you live your life today affects that. Listen, one of the things, I, I, I really don't care anymore about being popular. I, I want to know that whenever I look at the Lord, that the Lord can say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you're trying to tell people. You tried to tell them. So if they showed up empty handed, then it's not really on you. I asked you to be a watchman. You told them what I asked you to tell them. I'm here to tell you today. I'm here to tell you today. Whoever would watch, whoever would listen, that there's something bigger on the other side. When you take your last breath here and you take your first breath there, you're going to step into eternity. And I've said it many times. You're either going to make it in or you're not. And even if you make it in, you might be empty handed. You don't have to be. You can do the work of the kingdom. What does that mean? Live for Jesus. Let Jesus live through you. Take it one step at a time. One day at a time. Keep learning. Keep studying. Keep seeking. Amen. And, and partner together as a body of Christ as we move forward to do the things of God. Praise God. All right. Amen. But look, two things I want to ask you before you make the deal. <laughs> what I'm saying is there, there's deals going on all the time. Some of them are things that are given by God. Some of them are distractions from the enemy. Two things. How will this affect my eternal inheritance or purpose? The decision you're about to make, whether it's a new marriage, whether it's a new job, whether it's a new car, whether it's a new house, how will this decision affect my eternal inheritance? That's not my job to tell you what to do. All right. And then number two, is this decision consistent with the written word of God? Is the decision I'm about to make. And I'm not talking about you monkeying around with the word of God. <laughs> Can I, am I, is it okay if I say that? I'm not talking about cutting and pasting and making it work for you. I'm talking about whenever I read it and I get discernment from the Holy Spirit. This is what it says. Is the decision I'm about to make consistent with what it says. Amen. Now, if you ever, y'all know, y'all that have been coming to this church for any length of time, most of y'all got my number. The people text me and like, hey, what you think about this scripture sometimes, right? Now we got text church for many of you people. So those of you that have my number, if you don't have it, we'll get it for you. Praise God. And you can text. I love questions like that. It might take a while to get back to you, but I'm going to try to answer you. Because look, if you're seeking, I'm over here trying to help you find it. But you got to remember, I'm just mad. But I'm, I've been trying to, I want to help you. To be able to understand what do I think, and I'll and I'll try my best to try to explain that to you to help you to make a right decision. Amen. All right. So I'm going to conclude Second uh, Kings chapter two, uh, Second Kings chapter nine, verse thirty through thirty-three. Y'all ready? Here we go. We're going to just go ahead and start reading. Okay. It says, and when Jehu was come to Jezreel, so this is the new king. I'm just letting you know this is the new king. When Jehu was come to Jezreel. Jezebel heard of it and she painted her face. All right. Now, I don't know what you. Okay, let's just keep going. And she she tired. I, I, I would think that the word should have been teared, but she tired her head. What it means is she adorned her head. Whatever the fashion was in the day. I don't know. What's the fashion today? Back when I was in the 80s, girls would put those little things like that and they'd hold their hair back or some, huh? A headband and sometimes you'd have these little flower things that girls would put with a barrette right on their hair, right? And then and then now they Lord only knows what they do nowadays. But I'm just saying that during this time, a lot of times they'd braid it up and they'd wrap it up where it was real hot. They'd even probably put some gold leaf up in there, you know. So she that's what she did. She fixed her hair, dude. And then she painted her eyes, is what one of the translations says. She got herself all purdied up. And, and so what you think she tried? Well, let me just tell you a little bit of Jezebel's background. She was a seductress. See, Ahab's dead now. The king's dead. And she's sitting up in the palace. And Jehu's been anointed the new king. 
And Jay and Elijah said, Jezebel's blood, the dog's gonna lick that girl's blood after what she did to these prophets. Okay, coming against my king. See, one day the dog's gonna lick these people's blood. You see all this crazy stuff going on in the world? There ain't nobody getting away with none of this stuff. I'm telling you right now. The blood of the martyrs cries out to God ever since Abel was died and was on the ground, and his blood was in the ground. Okay, it's gonna happen. Trust me. But anyway, she fixed herself all up. She looked out the window, and as Jay, who entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri, I don't know how she said it, but I would imagine something like this, had Zimri peace who slew his master? Asked him from the window with her eyes all pretty. Up. See, she was bringing him back in the time frame of history when somebody named Zimri slew somebody that was in charge, and so she was trying to provoke his thought, are you sure this is what you really want to do? And she's probably blinking her eyes at me. You know, are you sure this is what you want to do? Now, by this time, look, I'm not trying to clown, because Lord knows we all getting older, but she probably is not like, if she was pretty, she probably ain't like she used to be, but she done painted herself up, and she's trying to she's trying to play the, run the same game on Jehu that she ran on Ahab. How, how many times how many times? You get the point. The devil keeps the thing. Okay, so Jehu, he lifted up his face to the window, verse 32, and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. <laughs> now, if you don't know what a eunuch is, that's a little bit strange, but it's a willingness to kind of, well, should I explain all that? I'll tell you what, I'll let you parents explain when you get home, if y'all know what a eunuch is. They took away their male hormones. Well, I'm just saying, they castrate them. They, they take away their male hormones so that they could focus on palace business and they didn't have to worry about them chasing the, the female servants around the palace. And they could focus on palace business, all right? There was a lot of eunuchs back in those days. All right, so it says right here, he lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on my side, who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs and he said, throw her down. <laughs> and so they threw her down and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses and he trod her underfoot. That's how Jezebel finished her life, that the eunuchs grabbed her up and threw her out the window and then Jehu's horse I just pranced on top of her. And then, you know, and it was even uglier than that. We won't get into it. The only thing they found was her skull and her hands by the time the dogs got done with her. That's the, that's the end of Jezebel. All right. Now, I want you to know that, that the enemy, he, he's always looking for entry. Ahab wants the vineyard, right? We don't give in to Jezebel, right? Jesus refused to give up the kingdom of God for earthly counterfeit. Naboth refused to sell the land. And look, the eunuch said, this is enough. It's enough. I can't prove this. But you're, I mean, I had a hard time convincing me that one of them eunuchs did not hear Jezebel's plan way back when we were talking about that last week. When she walked in, you remember I told you that? And Naboth was laying in the bed, and he didn't want to eat no bread. He was all sad. He was sitting there crying. And she said, what is wrong with you, boy? Are you the king of Israel and not get up, wipe your eyes, and eat some bread? Because I'm about to go get that vineyard for you, and this is what we're going to do. And I can't prove it. So this is Matt's commentary. But I believe one of them eunuchs was right there listening. Listening to that, and that they were aware of what was going on in the kingdom. And they sure enough killed Naboth. And they said, you know what? I done had enough of this. I done had enough of living my life under the harshness of this woman, this lying devil right here. We got an opportunity to serve a new king. Hallelujah. I'm about to take this wickedness, this darkness, this snake that done slithered into the garden. I'm about to pick her up. I'm about to throw her out of this window. Amen. And the Lord's looking for some people, hallelujah, that are ready to throw Jezebel out the window and to move forward in the things of God. Amen. And not to continue to trust in the things of darkness. 